ready. Okay, well, um, ladies and gentlemen, I um, am sorry to say that because I was working on my notes, I didn't see um, all of the fantastic presentation that we just had. I saw just enough of it to know that I'm probably going to be editing this one on the fly again so that it fits in better. We'll see how successful I are. I am. Uh, so I have the, this uh, title, Nature's Answer to Most Questions, and that's soil. And the picture that you're seeing is one that I took straddling of uh, the difference between a non cover crop sweet corn field and a cover crop sweet corn field in the second week of, of November in uh, 2016. It was part of a study that Minnesota NRCS was doing uh, that involved a multi-year, five-year agreement with growers to plant a multi-species cover crop. Multi-species just meant more than one. Usually they had three. This one, uh, there in some spots, there were four. Annually on the same acreage, they were not allowed to do fall tillage. Um, but other than that, pretty much whatever you wanted to do on your field. Um, this was sweet corn, so the crop was removed fairly early in the growing season because it was 2016. In, around the Twin Cities, that was a 220 day plus growing season. So the cover crops had an enormous amount of time to work with, and they were incredibly lush when we went to evaluate the field. So I'd like to start a little bit with. Uh, the idea just of soil, because we've been talking a lot about the ecology of systems, about plants, about insects, other animals, how they all fit together. But at some point, we also need to consider the soil itself. And so I like to say, well, what is it? It's a nexus. It's where six components come together. So you have sand, silt, clay, air, water, and organic matter. If the Minnesota State Fair uh, is open this year for business and you happen to go, climb up Machinery Hill and you'll come to Little Farm Hands. Little Farm Hands has an incredible exhibit about soil that I was privileged to help to produce and about how the land, the ground that we walk on is the fundamental basis of everything that happens above it and within it. So within soil, we have these four spaces. Um, I have the arrows indicating them up to 50%, depending on how much sand, silt, and clay there is. Of the volume of soil can be these pore spaces. And pore spaces are unique on planet Earth. They are the space where the air, the water, the minerals, the life all comes together within a three-dimensional space and interact. Um, the organisms that are living in soil exist neither on a surface the way we do, we, we kind of walk around on things, uh, nor in a volume through which they can move without constraints. So think about fish. You know, water is, you can be up and down in the water column. Um, they're existing within a volume that constrains them, kind of hard to move through it. You have to put in some significant effort, uh, but it's also one that they can modify to a significant degree, and they do, as we've seen earlier with the movement of soil by invertebrates. Uh, in so doing, they're also major players in what we consider to be uh, the big cycles on planet Earth. So yes, water will cycle uh, if there's nothing there except bare rock and water and sky. But since you have soil, you've introduced plants into this. So that affects the water cycle. Soil can be a source or a sink of nitrogen and phosphorus, potassium, depending on how the cycle is working. It's soil is a place where carbon can be productively sequestered by the action of plants and by the action of humans in allowing that soil to hold it. Or it can become a source of carbon when we disturb it or when it becomes so warm that carbon just starts to come out of it because permafrost is melting. It can be a mitigator of water pollution. It can also be an exacerbator of water pollution. When you think about runoff and the fact that we have millions and millions of tons of the sand and silt and clay, but especially the silt and clay, which are associated with the organic matter 
and with the nutrients that are in the soil. When we allow them to run off or we allow them to blow off, we're creating an opportunity for those things that we want to be in place to move to where we don't want them. A couple of years ago, I saw an article, I, actually, I think it was 2019, come to think of it, um, that noted satellite analysis had said that there were now more brown or green lakes in the United States than blue lakes. And this was because of the movement of, of uh, materials, specifically of nutrients, off of fields into the waterways. So if you have of that sand, silt, clay, air, water, organic matter, the, the six components, if you only have the first five, what you've got is dirt. And what we're really finding out right now, because we do have this other laboratory, it's called Mars, uh, is that that sixth component of soil is, is where all the good stuff happens. It's really where the action is. And I don't know how many of you either read The Martian or saw the movie, uh, The Martian, I did both. Um, duct tape is uh, magical and should be worshiped. Um, but we had the scene where Mark Watney, the astronaut, becomes convinced in a blinding flash of inspiration, also his scientific background, that he can use uh, human feces to grow potatoes and therefore not starve. Well, what that second laboratory is now showing us is that farming on Mars would actually be quite a bit harder. There is a recent study published, a couple of studies actually, in Icarus on the 15th of January. Um, researchers tried three different fake Mars-like soils. They had two of them that were mined, naturally occurring, looked like Martian soil, uh, some from Hawaii, some from the Mar uh, Mojave Desert. And then they formulated one uh, using volcanic rock, uh, clays, silt, salts, other chemicals that Curiosity has documented in its roving around Mars and that you can see all of those elements in the can plants grow with Mars soil slide that uh, NASA had created. And what the researchers found is that both lettuce and Arabidopsis would grow in the natural Mars-like soils as long as you gave them liquid fertilizers. So they needed nitrogen, um, potassium and calcium in particular, some minor nutrients, but neither would grow in the synthetic dirt that was more Mars-like than Earth-like, um, even if you transplanted them. So they did a closer analysis of their Mars-like dirt, and they found that it had a very high pH, 9.5, 9 versus about 7 in Mars-like soils, which is much more typical of Earth soils in general. And so they acidified the Martian soil with hydro, um, with uh, sulfuric acid rather. Um, and they got the pH down to 7.2 and they still couldn't get uh, the seeds to germinate, but they could get transplants to live for maybe a week longer than they would have otherwise. Then they discovered that their original recipe had omitted calcium perchlorate, which um, Curiosity has now documented as potentially a very major component of the Mars surface, maybe 2% of the surface. So they added that to the Mars-like soil, and then they found that nothing grew at all because this is a toxic salt. Now on Earth, we don't have trouble with that toxic salt because of that organic matter, that sixth component contains bacteria that eat it. And while they're eating it, they emit oxygen. And so the authors were thinking and others were thinking that it would be interesting. Could this be a terraforming opportunity? You could make the soil um, more Earth-like, more friendly, less toxic. And at the same time, you'd be doing on Mars what cyanobacteria did on Earth, creating an oxygen atmosphere uh, that would eventually potentially create an ozone layer and a more habitable planet. And shouldn't this really start to get us feeling like there is no practical planet B? Because if we're talking about terraforming on that scale, we're kind of in trouble. So that brings us back to planet A and what we need to do now, what we can do now to help planet A. And then recently, I'd say since, dare I be sounding just a bad political, since November, 
especially. Uh, regenerative ag and soil health are, are very hot topics. So what is soil health? Well, the USDA has a definition. You saw it yesterday. The crux of that definition is the capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. I don't like that definition. And I don't like it in part because it betrays an above ground bias. It tends to show that we think of soil still, even when we're talking about it as an ecosystem, we still tend to think about it in terms of use. What can soil do for us instead of what can we do for soil? Soil doesn't have agency. Now, when I look at it, I bring a different perspective and that's one that actually comes from a Supreme Court decision in 1964, Jacobus versus Jacobellus versus Ohio, in which Justice Potter Stewart wrote something that has broad applicability, applicability in many areas other than the one he was referring to. And the quote is this, I shall not today further attempt to define the kinds of material I understand to be embraced within that shorthand description. He was talking about something you don't need to worry about. But I know it when I see it. So when you look at these two clods and they are superimposed over the sides of the fields that they came from, I know it when I see it. On the one on to mine, the left, where you see macropore, uh, you have a very blocky structure. It looks like brown concrete. It was surprisingly heavy. Um, on the right, on you have a, a clod that crumbles easily. It breaks up. You can see looking at it that it's not massive. It's not blocky. In one, you have no visible roots, although there is the shadow of a former root, the macropore. That's from a corn root system that had gotten yanked out of the ground. Uh, on the other one, you've got active roots. You've got fungal hyphae, the white threads through the soil. Um, in fact, it's ribbon with this kind of activity. And then when we broke them open and we smelled them, the, the cloddy, blocky one had just the barest sort of vaguely mineral scent. When we broke open the other one, uh, there was the rich smell, that wonderful smell of soil, which is um, a bicyclic alcohol called jasmine. And it's produced by microbes actually in an act of um, what, what might be called bacteriological warfare against other microbes. But that's an indication of a vibrant mi microbiological community in that soil, and it was there. So the contrast between those two was fairly obvious. Another thing to note is that we have two very different soil environments in these two plots. We define the rhizosphere as the area of soil within one inch of a root. So if you look at clod B, we'll call it the one with all the roots and the hyphae, probably most of that soil would fall within the rhizosphere. In the other one, I can't see any that falls within the rhizosphere. The rhizosphere is the most biologically active area of the soil. This is because of root exudates. So plants, provide about 21% of fixed carbon out into the soil. This is both to feed the organisms around them that they're uh, dependent on and to communicate with them. It's a very complex mixture of things that are, are uh, sent out through the roots. You've got sugars, uh, some small lipids, amino acids, peptides, both for food and as signaling. Now, plants in general send about 50% of the carbon that they fix from the atmosphere to the roots, in part because just being a root takes so much energy. You're um, elongating through the soil, you're holding up the plant above you, you're doing all the regulatory work of bringing water in, of sending the exudates out. So it, it's a major part of the plant and the plant uh, provisions it accordingly. So when we look at those two clods again, more roots in the soil means more of the soil is part of the rhizosphere, is active, is alive. Less roots in the soil means that you've got more food deserts in the soil. So that in the next year, when you come back, that soil is more poorly provisioned. Uh, the rhizosphere also has the greatest impact on soil structure. 
because of the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. I'm willing to bet that some of those hyphae that we can see might be part of the ARM. Uh, they both extend the root's effective range. It can be up to tenfold. Uh, and they make glomalin. And glomalin is one of these magical things that we've only recently come to understand as a soil glue. So it helps bind soil together into stable aggregates, which is how soil is better able to hold up plants. This is also the area of the soil with the highest nutrient cycling. You have an insane feeding frenzy going on, especially right next to the roots where microbes are taking up some of the exudates, then they themselves are getting attacked by other microbes. And then you get the release of the materials in the microbe, as well as the cycling that's going on with the bacteria that are involved in nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium cycling in the soil. The rhizosphere is also, unfortunately, but predictably, uh, the area of soil that's most impacted by us. So plant roots, and therefore the rhizosphere, and fungi are densest in the top eight inches of soil. And fungi just get crushed by tillage. They get ripped to shreds. And most soil organic matter is in the top four inches. And tillage can cause that soil organic matter to be exposed to air and to be oxidized um, opportunistically by bacteria. So roots, as you might have figured out by now, are just the beginning of the life that's in the soil. Uh, I have a rather complete, but certainly not absolutely complete list of the various groups that are in soil and pictures of some. The soil biome is Earth's largest and most diverse concentration of living biomass. I like to think of it as an upended rainforest with all those different layers of canopy. In a really healthy soil, you'll have all those different layers of community going from the surface on down. Uh, we also, in, in a really healthy soil, a very lively, well-connected soil, effectively have an internet of soil things. Plants, we now know, can communicate with one another, sing messages along the lines of, help, I'm being attacked by an herbivore, or, hey, it's getting dry over here, you might want to close your stomata. Um, if, if you can hear that, that's one of my dogs in the background. Um, in the top six inches of healthy soil, we could have up to 20,000 pounds of organisms per acre. Now that's just organisms. That's in addition to all the other organic matter not living at the time uh, that would be in that top six inches. A teaspoon, which is about a gram of soil, can contain 10 billion microbes representing about 11,000 species at last count. This is the reason why when you are picnicking and you drop your sandwich, you leave it on the ground because some of those 11,000 species might think of you as food too. You might want to just, the sandwich is soil organic matter now, just leave it. All of those organisms are effectively supported by the primary productivity of plants. There is some algae in soil, but nowhere near enough to support that kind of biomass. Uh, earthworms, interestingly, are the largest invertebrate group by biomass. You could have between 50 and 300 of them per square meter in crops, uh, between one and 500 per square meter in grasslands and temperate woodlands. Um, I find this ironic because they don't belong here. And I find it a little bit uh, alarming, and I see my drape is about to fall down, the lighting conditions in here might suddenly change. Uh, I find it a little alarming because we now have Asian earthworms. I read an article yesterday, it was just recently published in the last month or so, about uh, Asian earthworms and research done at the UW Arboretum in Madison. They found that uh, if you looked at the soil in an area where the Asian earthworm had been present for at least a year, that the carbon nitrogen ratio in the soil was down, nitrogen content of the soil was up, which means that that soil in theory could be a greater pollution risk for surrounding waters. Uh, there were changes in the bacterial and fungal 
uh, complements of the soil and the basal respiration rate of the soil was higher. So the soil could actually be emitting more in the way of carbon dioxide. So if there's anything you can do to keep Asian earthworms off your land, so never buy them as fishing worms, don't buy them as composting worms, think about where uh, plants that you're buying are coming from because they may come in a nursery stock, do those things because you don't wanna have them too. In 1952, uh, there was a study done to give you a kind of an idea of relative abundance of these things in the soil at the Duke Forest in North Carolina. Uh, they used a variety of ways to sample the soil, including pitfall traps, and they estimated 124 million arthropods per acre, of which 90 million were mites. So on the second row of um, creatures over to the right side is a predatory mite. There is an entire ecosystem of mites going on in the soil, as well as an entire ecosystem of nematodes. They also saw 28 million springtails and 45 million other insects. They weren't set up probably to do the really, really small stuff like the nematodes. They're not included in the list. A, at about the same time, a similar study done in Pennsylvania on farmland found 425 million arthropods per acre, including 209 million mites, 119 million springtails. This should be becoming a, a trend here. We have mites, we have springtails, then we have some of everything else, about 11 million others. Now, my question now, given what we know about what's happening with insects generally, is if we replicated these studies using the exact same techniques and in the exact same places, how many creatures would we find now? What I'm afraid is that we would find fewer in both cases. So what can we start to do to help? I like to keep things pretty simple. I go with NRCS's basic four practices plus one. So the first is minimize disturbance. You saw this yesterday, but there are two really important reasons to minimize disturbance. And disturbance is either tillage or traffic. So if you look at the bottom of the slide, I have tillage disturbance profiles for the various means that we commonly disturb soil. There's moldboard plow and rototiller. They both do the same thing, although I think rototillers can be worse. Uh, that can go to 10 inches. Each box represents a 30 inch wide row space and a row crop by 14 inches deep. A subsoil shank for people who are trying to break up uh, their soil a bit would only affect the area pretty much immediately where that shank passed. But if you look at a no-till drill or knife, you have to go to the top of the arrow and see that little tiny space, just a tiny little cut open for a seed to be introduced. Otherwise, the soil, its arrangements, its creatures, its fungi, its other rooting systems are all left in place. Tillage of the moldboard plow or rototiller type will eventually form a plow pan. A plow pan will impede root growth. It impedes water infiltration. You can sort of think of it as an impervious layer, not quite impervious, um, but they can be very, very durable. In the case of the radish, uh, that my colleague is holding there. If you look at it carefully, you'll see that that radish is twisted twice. So it encountered a plow pan close to his hand. You can see that the radish starts to bend. It did not find a crack or an earthworm hole or anything. It did not in its area of elongation. And so it kept trying to elongate and it ended up pushing itself up out of the ground because it is a root and not a stem, uh, it then flopped over. But because the pho positive phototropism response uh, was then engaged because it had to rearrange its leaves now on the ground, the top of the radish bent 90 degrees from the ground to get the uh, top rearranged and the more effective and efficient arrangement of photosynthetic solar panels. If you look carefully at that radish, 
Uh, there's part of it that's clean, part of it that's dirty. The part of it that's dirty basically tells you how far into the soil we could dig before we started encountering an area that fractured horizontally. So that's where the plow pan was. Tillage also, as I noted, increases oxidation of soil organic matter. Not something we want to see, particularly since it's estimated that we have already lost half of the soil organic matter that we had in agricultural soils. It went to two places, neither of which it's doing any good. Uh, it went into the air where we don't want it. Some of it uh, went in the form of runoff in the waters where we don't want it. The other thing about disturbance is um, with traction, I mean, pardon me, with traffic, you can get compaction. So those two blue images on the right, those are uh, CT scans of soil cores. Uh, they were taken uh, 10 inches below the surface. They're both about eight inches high and eight inches in diameter. They came from the sugar beet field in Denmark. And uh, the sugar beet field had been harvested mechanically, as one might expect, and sugar beet harvesters are kind of big machines. The core on the left was taken from an area along the fence line that had not seen any traffic. And you can see the wonderful pore structure, and these are the big pores. Um, the ability of air and water and roots and animals to move up and down and side to side through these large pores that were documented in the soil. The one on the right had been passed over by the sugar beet harvester once, 14 years before the pore was dug. And as you can see in that 14 years, very little of that pore structure has been recovered, has been rebuilt by earthworms, which are native in Denmark, and um, roots, and even the action of freezing and thawing. You have a little bit of pores and, and more gaping open areas on the top, but the ability of things to move down and up through the soil profile has been thoroughly disrupted. We want to not do that. Second one, increase plant diversity. So soil definitely needs partners and natural ecosystems, as we are being reminded frequently and appropriately, are diverse. If you look at the um, picture in, on the left side, the hand drawing, um, that was a, a PhD that was done in 1919 where, with somebody sitting down and painstakingly taking a spoon and digging away and documenting the root structures of different prairie plants. He was actually working in uh, Eastern Washington. I've circled one particular genus, which is P, Poa. That is the most common lawn grass. Poa cratensis is Kentucky bluegrass. It only roots to six inches. Now, in a cornfield, you might get roots to six feet. A soybean field will get you another six feet. Alfalfa, which is known for uh, nourishing soil and restoring some of its um, characteristics that we consider valuable, like the, the ability to infiltrate and fertility, uh, we'll go down to 20 feet, but that's kind of rare for our crop plants. If you have a variety of root systems, as in that picture, lots of different plants, lots of different root shapes, tap roots, fibrous roots, you're going to get a variety of associations with those plants, creating a diverse network in the soil, both of the roots themselves, the associated fungi, the associated microbes. They're going to be laying down carbon and nutrients at different layers of the soil. This is that upside down rainforest canopy idea I talked about earlier. And because plants have some general associations and some type associations, another thing that they're doing is they're kind of preparing the ground for themselves going forward. So if you had had the opportunity to participate in the Gustavus Adolphus uh, Nobel uh, seminar a couple of years ago on soil. It was Nobel 54 and they do have it posted. Um, you might have seen the uh, presentation talking about these assemblages in soils. And there was one that really caught my eye because I had tried growing this plant in my yard, big blue stem. 
a native prairie grass may be considered as a bioenergy crop. Phenomenal, dense, fibrous root system, great for the soil. It turns out that big blue stem has a, a partner in the soil called Verruco microbial. If you tried to culture Verruco, Verruco microbia, Verruco, I can never say that, but a microbia in the lab, you would find that it was very hard to grow. You might not be able to culture it at all. It needs the roots. Likewise, if you try growing big blue stem in the soil that does not have Verruco microbia, you'll find that it is less able to tolerate uh, cold snaps, freeze thaw, and it's also more drought sensitive. Now, it just so happens that I had my big blue stem planted along my driveway where it would get um, droughty conditions because the driveway heats up so much during the summer and also be subject to the uh, sudden changes in temperature from being on the north side of a building at times, and it did very poorly. If you have a monoculture in the soil, uh, you are not going to get that benefit of association. And when you have clean fields, even worse. So think of that cornfield you drive past where there's the picket fence of corn stalks and nothing in between them. You're also concentrating your fixed carbon in strips. So you're building in these little food deserts. Increasing diversity, if you're trying to do it, I would recommend use native plants where possible to pick up on those native associations may, that may still be in your soil. Cell health practice number three, keep the soil covered. Again, two reasons to do this. Uh, one is erosion and the other is temperature. We'll start with temperature. Uh, the two thermometers on the lower left, that's taken in a cornfield in Nebraska in July. On one case, you've got cover crops. Even though it's the middle of July and it's noon, the soil hasn't reached 90 degrees yet. On the other one, it's well over 100. You're already approaching the danger zone with all those hours of sunlight yet for soil bacteria. But you're also, in that circumstance, stressing out your plants and making them less efficient at the things that they're doing. So. Plants have a very complicated system for photosynthesis. The enzymes that uh, do this marvelous trans transition from uh, carbon dioxide and water to sugar and oxygen operate best somewhere between 77 Fahrenheit and 95 Fahrenheit. Once you get above 95 Fahrenheit, the plant starts to air condition itself. And it's the same way that tall buildings air condition themselves pulls up water through the roots, throws it out through the stomata on the leaves. When the water evaporates, the, the heat of evaporation per se cools the air immediately around the plant. It also cools the surface of the leaf, lowering heat stress. The more the plant has to do that, the more of the water it can bring up is used for that purpose. And the more of the energy it might gain through photosynthesis, is used to keep pulling up the water. So it becomes a less and less productive process in terms of building up sugars throughout the day. The other thing is it dries the soil. And interestingly, water has a higher uh, specific heat than the mineral components of soil. So as you pull water out of the soil, you're actually starting to make the soil easier to warm and you're risking a vicious cycle that could raise it suddenly and cause more stress to the plants and the bacteria. One thing I'd like you to note also, not just the upper temperature, the fluctuation. On the graph to the right, I had two cornfields. This is my research that I was doing at Rosemount. This is Ju June of 2006. One of the cornfields, clean field, the pre-emergence herbicide worked admirably. There wasn't anything growing there but corn. In the other part of the field, I had various amounts of grass. The green um, markers are where there was no grass removal at all. And in some of those plots, I had so much grass that the corn was skinny, it couldn't keep up with the grass, at least at that point in June. So you can pretty much tell just looking at that graph, which days are sunny because the red and the green superimpose. You can tell which nights are clear because down at the bottom, 
the um, red dots, the soil is cooling off more uh, than under that blanket of grass where you get that, that modifying effect of air temperature. But at the far end, there were three sunny days where even though it's only June and we haven't really built up the soil temperature yet, it was already getting well above 80 degrees. Well, by the time we got to October, I mean, October, August rather, in that field, we had to water down the alleys because the soil had gotten so hot that you could not comfortably walk on it wearing work boots. So I can imagine that we're, what we were probably doing in that uncovered soil was literally cooking out the life underneath it. So going back to the question of erosion, soil also needs armor. This is a single raindrop encountering soil. If you look closely, you'll see little dark bits in the splash. That is sand, silt, clay, and organic matter getting blasted apart by a rain bomb. The, these raindrops can fall at up to 20 miles an hour. When they hit, if there's a film of water already on the soil, they can throw particles five feet horizontally and two feet vertically. I'm sure all of you have seen this against a white building where you have bare soil in front of it. You get that nice brown about two feet up the building. One storm can wash out uh, almost a half an inch of soil or five tons per acre. That's a couple of dump trucks going out. Uh, once you get that blowing a part of the soil particle. But if your soil is covered, it can withstand this kind of activity. So the well-armored soil can take a beating is a field that has had 13 inches of rain in 24 hours. It's not tilled. It has a diverse crop rotation. Uh, they graze animals on it. Uh, there are cover crops, obviously. You can see the rows of the crop with the cover crops in between. 13 inches of rain in 24 hours, and there's not a puddle to be seen. The other picture is of a field in Iowa that had had only 14, four inches of rain, and it's effectively destroyed. There is a river running through it of all the good stuff, which is now going into the ditch. And when we think about a four inch rain, that used to be a pretty significant storm. But the, with climate change, what we're seeing is that the mega rain events, which would be like that 13 inch rain, and the four inch rains, which are not showing on the graph, are becoming more and more frequent. So what is happening is that our soil is taking a beating. It doesn't get the nice gentle rains anymore. When you get the rain bombs to sicken, disintegrating the soil, the soil will start to crust and crack and infiltration is even more disadvantaged. That's when you start seeing another vicious cycle developing of just losing the good parts of soil. Now, I would not be a scientist if I did not show you one awful graph. So here is my awful graph. It comes from the Soil Health Initiative study. Um, we looked at paired fields. So as you saw earlier, there's a cover crop side, a non-cover crop side. Each blue bar represents a cover crop field. Each gray bar represents a non-cover crop field. The green line is the average of one year in cover crops. The purple line is the average of three years in cover crops. And then I have also indicated with the yellow bars which farms had conventional reduced strip or no-till in the spring on the cover crop side only. I didn't have enough information to know uh, what both fields had been doing. What we found is that overall cover crop fields infiltrated 3.1 inches per hour more than non-cover crop fields. That's pretty significant. One year sites had a 1.7 inch per hour gap at three year sites across the boards. That's that purple line. It's 4.1 inches per hour. So a really heavy rainstorm, those fields were ready to receive it. That soil could take that water in. If you add the tillage component at one year, 
of cover crops with spring tillage, you only saw 0.4 inches per hour increase. Whereas in the no-till, it was 2.8. At three years of cover crops with spring tillage, you had 2.2, an increase, that's good. But in the no-till fields, the difference between the no-till cover crop three years and the no cover crop, no-till in some cases, three-year fields was five inches an hour. So we saw a, an accumulating benefit of the action of the cover crops, actions multiply of the cover crops, but one that could be turned back if you decided that you needed to turn that soil. Cell health practice number four, maintain living roots. Part of this is strictly self-serving for the invertebrates out there, their poikilotherms. If it's warm enough, they're active. So when you think about our growing seasons now, we are getting things uh, warming up in the spring. I'm looking across the street at my west facing uh, neighbors and they have no snow in their front yards. Um, and we're gonna have a longer and longer growing season going into the fall. But if we only have plants on the land um, for six months, if it's a row crop or actively for maybe eight months, if it's a, a all purpose lawn, uh, what we're doing is we're leaving the soil unfed for part of that time. We're also, because we don't have living roots to take up nutrients that are cycling out of detritus and uh, of microbes that are being eaten while the soil is still warm and active, we're letting those nutrients just kind of sit. And perhaps then they'd be available to run off and not be available in the spring. So having a living root there to keep feeding the soil and to keep those nutrients in place is important. When we did the soil health initiative, one of the things that was accidentally exciting about it was that it was such a hard test because we were sampling in October and November. Normally, we would have been sampling in, say, August, maybe September. But in that year, with that extraordinarily long growing season, we really got to see the contrast between soils that were no longer fed and soils that were still being fed because we didn't stop sampling until uh, it actually froze, which was the week of Thanksgiving. In the sweet corn fields, since all of the crops had either senesced or been removed, so in the sweet corn farms, it could have been a month or more since the crop senesced was removed and when we came and sampled that soil. In that month of warm days and, and adequate rains, the cover crop fields were very well supplied. This is one that is not necessarily included in all recommendations by NRCS, which is include herbivores where practical. And usually when I see it, it's livestock. And I'd like to expand that out because we don't just have farm soil, as you may have noticed, I've been including here and there things like the perennial border on the last slide. Well, here I'd like to have our urban wolves with their buckthorn uh, right there for the inclusion of all soils together in this particular idea. In an urban area, we might have goats, we might have deer, we might have rabbits. Those are all herbivores. Uh, on a farm, this is these pictures were taken at the Minokin farm, which is a research farm in uh, Burley County, North Dakota. They have rotational grazing specialists. I have to say that the rotational grazing specialists were not too impressed when we came into their paddock. Uh, they all went to one end of the field and gave us the evil eye the whole time our group was there. But what they are doing is they are moderating and regulating plant growth by the action of their feeding. So if you take the tip off, there went my, my drape, but I don't need it anymore. Yay. Um, if you take the tip off a growing plant, the, the main um, growing point, then the auxins, which are produced in that main leader, stop flowing. That tells the plant to start branching. If you are a grass, when you start branching, you also start rooting. 
So if you look at the soil beneath the cattle, uh, you see that there is a lot of rooting going on in there because there's been a lot of branching going on. And the rooting goes both horizontally and vertically. This is creating a much better uh, soil structure and has also allowed there to be the development of a deeper O horizon, which is the organic or duff layer right on top of the surface of the topsoil, which is the A horizon. In between those two though, you've got the, the first line of recyclers, which in this case is dung beetles. Dung beetles are one of the most handy animals that ever evolved on the planet. Without dung beetles, we would probably all be hip deep in old feces. So within moments, in fact, the cow pat that uh, we cut open to look for them was, was still steaming. Within moments, that group of beetles is going to hone in on this resource. It is their singles bar. It is everything else to them. And they will mate, sometimes live the rest of their lives in there. They will take some of that dung directly down into the soil, or they may roll it into a ball and move it to a slightly different location, but they will use that to pre provision their larvae. So they take that dung. This is super speeding up the, the process of nutrient recycling. It's already digested by the ungulates with the, or the ruminants with their uh, complex digestive systems. Now you're putting it down in the soil, you're running part of it through an insect. So you're getting additional digestion of that organic matter. And because it's already been put in the soil conveniently for you, uh, then you are going to have a much quicker uptake by it. Now, when I got to the point of doing soil health, I came as an entomologist. And one of the things that I was attuned to look for was insects in the soil, because soil is the place where we think about 90% of insects spend part of their lifetime. In the Northern hemisphere, it's usually a resting place to avoid bad conditions. So you could be an egg waiting out winter. You could be a pupa waiting out winter down in the soil where you're not going to be bothered. When we were sampling this field, this was one of three fields in Ottertail County, we got a real hands-on look at the difference between a healthy soil with a lot of residents and a couple of less healthy soils. The field pictured here had been prairie until 1887. It was then broken, moldboard plowed, conventionally uh, farmed until 1987 when the DNR uh, bought it and did a prey restoration and perennial grass planting. We sampled it in 2018. I do have to say that when we were sampling it, we could still see the plow pan. It was still there that many years later. But above there, the soil had made a phenomenal recovery. All of these insects were found, and these are just the ones I managed to get pictures of. I was trying to take notes of all the different things that I was seeing, and I could not literally keep up. There were so many different insects in that field. The third, second field that we sampled there was still in conventional corn soybean up through 2017. It had just transitioned to no-till that spring. So no-till hadn't had time to really do anything with it yet. And then third field that we sampled had been transitioned over to pasture in 2017 and was growing in a, a mixture of mainly red clover when we saw it. Hi, Anne. This is Lori. Your talk is going amazing, and we've got a ton of questions for you. So um, just finish up, and when you're ready, we'll, we'll throw some questions your way. Excellent, because I'm almost done. So you see all of these different insects. The two Lepidoptera, the butterfly and then the caterpillar on the lower right, they're in the O horizon. Everybody else we found deeper down in the soil. And these butterflies really got my attention. They're grass specialists. Corn is a big grass. When we went into the cornfield next door, we didn't see any of them. In fact, none of those insects 
that I just had pictured were found in the cornfield next door. We saw a few ants. There's a field road going through it, a little bit of white clover. We saw a couple of honeybees working that white clover. When I was in the soil looking for bare soil, which obviously was pretty easy to see, um, I noticed that there were a lot of mosquitoes in there, but mosquitoes like corn because it has lots of places that catch water. And uh, there is enough water in the corn leaf axle to support an egg or two all the way through. So plenty of mosquitoes. Above them, the dragonflies that feed on mosquitoes, but not much else. In fact, we didn't even find very many earthworms in this soil. It was so completely dead. And I didn't realize how much of the soil life had been removed until I looked at the picture and I saw that brown thing that circled. That's a soybean leaf from the year before. Soybean leaves are high in nitrogen. They should be chewed up and recycled almost immediately. And that's still there. And there is uh, corn debris that's two years old and it's still there and it's still fairly intact. And it's still fairly intact because there aren't shredders in this system. That first part of getting nutrients recycling of returning organic matter to the soil, it just seemed to be completely missing here. So the only recycling that would be happening with this crop debris was the recycling that could happen on a surface where a bacterium might be able to colonize it, where a fungus might be able to get a hypha in contact with it. So everything here can be thought of as organic matter in stasis. It's not going to move. So we have one last slide. And I'll just kind of finish with this one. Soil has this easy button. It's the soil food web. I've been trying to kind of give you an idea of some of its attributes, of some of the ways that we affect it. That easy button only works when it's connected. And to be connected, that means we can't keep adding things to the soil the way we do, because then we recite, we short circuit the need for plants to call for that development to their rises here. We can't be turning things over because then we're physically disrupting it, we're biochemically disrupting it. And then when we're adding all of the insecticides, nematicides, herbicides that we have to use when we're doing conventional management, when we're intentionally stripping systems, be it a lawn or a forest or a farm field, or anything, when we're trying to make them do just a very narrow range of things, we have to physically, chemically, or biologically kill other things that would be competing with what we perceive to be our needs. That makes that system even poorer still. In a planet that's exhibiting stress in every possible way, I think it's a better idea just to hit that easy button and let the soil food web do some of the heavy lifting for us. And that's my take on soil health. That is great, Anne. And um, let me say, you opened up a can of worms. Oh. <laughs> so here's your first question. Um, earthworms, native, non-native, pest or beneficial insect or rather animal? That depends on your point of view. Most earthworms in North America don't belong here because the glaciers took out our earthworms as we learned yesterday. Um, but this is a big but and I say it reservedly. Um, as was also mentioned yesterday, earthworms are considered a so sign of soil health. In fact, in most evaluations, they are the only animal that's counted. We don't worry about ants. We don't worry about anything else. We just count earthworms. I can see earthworms in both lights. If I have a thoroughly degraded soil and I can get a few earthworms in it, like my backyard, um, and I can get them to start doing the work of turning and mixing that they will do, then they're my partners in reviving the soil. 
Asian jumping worms, I absolutely draw the line. Don't want them, as I mentioned earlier. If I had a woodlot, I would be wanting to restrict earthworms because in woods, they are turning in the duff layer, <clears throat> excuse me, and that is interfering with the uh, natural processes of plants in the woodland or the wood ducks who need to have something nice and soft to land on when they jump out of the trees. So I can't say earthworms good or earthworms bad. I can say earthworms, it depends. Right, that makes perfect sense. Here's, um, I think we have time for one more question, although there's so many here, maybe we can do, a, do two quickies. So what do you think of adding micro orzai inoculants to soil when doing restoration or home projects? I would rather add the inocula to the plants. If you're doing seeds you know, and, and you can do a little inoculation of the seed, that would be fine. Uh, if you're doing a transplant, you wanna do a dip, uh, that would be fine because then you know they're where they need to be. If you're just doing a broadcast application, then you're introducing an organism. And if you're introducing an organism, one of the first questions is, can it thrive or have you just thrown your money away? If it can't thrive, um, what was the point? If it does thrive, is it compatible with what's already there? Or might you be starting the process similar to what <clears throat> the Asian jumping worm is doing which is changing the microbial and fungal communities of the soil in which it lives because it brings its own associates with it. So are you doing more harm than good with a broad application? A targeted application allows the plant to make use. And then if the plant is making use successfully and this inoculum is compatible with the environment in which it is placed with the plant. It'll be there anyway. Thank you, Anne. This has been so such a powerful presentation and useful information for home gardeners to restoration um, practitioners. So thank you 